going to start off, and um, we're going to take a minute to go through what we went over last time, um, but in more detail, and, and we're going to look at, at the code um, more extensively. Um, I might try to have it for a couple instructions. I might try to have it where um, the code is projecting and I can write around it. So I'll try to figure out a way to do that because I think sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words and I want you to be able to see the code but also sort of get the get a, get a, a visual picture of, of exactly what's going on. Uh, especially when we talk about inflating. Because inflating in the past, I found students have had some difficulty with that. It seems a little confusing uh, to them. So um, we will um, we will we will we'll try to do that. So let's start off by looking at the main activity. One thing I thought of, I think it would be a good exercise for you to write. And this isn't like an assignment or anything, but a good way to learn and to understand, really understand the app, would be for you to write your own comments for some of the functions. Um, there, these are commented, um, but to write comments that are meaningful to you, I think, could be very useful. So maybe you take the Twitter search example and, and go in and, and comment some of the code. All right. So, we have our activity. We have our things that we're interested in. All right. Um, our controls, the text, uh, the, the text uh, edit text fields, the floating activity button, our pointer to the shared preferences, our list of tags, and our adapter. Remember, an adapter is what sort of is used to supply the data for the recycler view. All right, so um, we have the recycler view, we have a data source, and the adapter sort of links the two. The tags are sort of the data source. The adapter is what sort of merges those two. And so that in the recycler view, you can see the data that you want to see. Typically, we're going to put things up here if we want them to be shared among several uh, functions within the class. These are, these are sometimes called instance variables. It means that one of these, there's one of these variables for each instance of the application that's running. And on an Android phone, you can only have one instance running, I believe, uh, of the same application. So, you have one of these and is available throughout the class is the bottom line. As opposed to um, variables which are declared within a function, those only exist for the lifetime of the function. These variables exist um, for the life of the class. All right. So when we do an on create for this activity, we set our main XML file. And we had three XML files, remember. We had our activity main, which is sort of the shell. We have an include to include the content main, which is sort of the main section of it. Then we have a list item that we're going to be using in a minute here when we start inflating the layout. We grab pointers to our edit fields. All that is pretty, um, pretty um, straightforward, very similar to what we did in other applications. We grab a new array list from save searches. What is save searches? It's the section of the shared preference in Android that is labeled by the word searches. All right, we have a constant called searches, which is equal to searches. So it pulls up everything that this application has served, has saved before. All right. Because what we're saving stuff in the shared preferences. To refresh our memory, the shared preferences is an associative array or a hash. And that is simply, there's different sections in, in the, uh, the save preferences. So each application can save its preferences without interfering with other applications.
applications preferences. Um, and it consists of a, an array where the index of the array is not a number, but it's a word. So that's where, in this application, we have our tags and our searches. So we're grabbing all of the keys from the, from the shared preferences. And the keys in this shared preferences represent what this application is calling the tags. So our tags array is going to have well, that's weird. Our tags array is going to have a list of all the tags that we've saved previously. Those are the keys in our shared preference area, which is called searches. So now we have an array list that has those things. We sort that array list, just to put them in alphabetical order. Finally, we create our adapter. And after we create the adapter, we set the adapter with the recycler view. And that's what does the binding between the recycler view and the adapter. So let's see what happens when we create the adapter. We say adapter equals new search ad adapter. We're calling the constructor on our searches adapter class. We're giving it the tags. What are the tags? The tags are, uh, again, the tags that we saved. So they would be these things in our application. CC, Cleveland Sports, LCCC, all the things that we'd say before as the tags. We give the different click listeners that we've defined. Item click listener and item long click listener. And we pass those as arguments to the constructor. So let's see what this happens, what happens when we set the constructor. The constructor is just going to set these instance variables. All right, it's going to set our tags instance variable, and it's going to set the click listeners, both the long click listener and the regular click listener. It's going to send out some of those arguments. So those are going to be available. Now this class, this object, has these parameters stored. It has the list of tags that's going to be used to populate the uh, recycle, recycler view, and it has the two listeners that are going to be used. Remember, each item has the same listener in this case. All these items, the same thing happens if you click it versus long click on it, because they have the same listener. For every row that we create, in this recycler view, we're going to assign that row the same listeners for regular click and long click. <laughs> now, we have an, a, a, a nested subclass called view holder, which is going to be used um, to set up the layout of each item in our recycler view. All right. So when the view holder is created, get the item view and the two click listeners. When is that view holder created? It's created 
on create view holder. All right. When does on create view holder get executed? It gets executed when we bind our adapter to our control, to our recycler view. So this, setting the adapter, is going to execute this going to execute this on create view holder. So what are the sequence of events here? We get the item count. That is necessary so it knows how many rows to create in the, um, in the recycler view. We inflate the layout. This is what I want to look at. I create a view all right, by saying layout inflator from blah, 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 our layout list item. Our layout list item is this item right here. It's the XML that contains what one row looks like. And one row only contains a text view whose ID is text view. So now I'm going to try to write this up on the board as we're looking at the code. These events get fired off when we assign our, um, this is the behavior of the recycler adapter to go through and trigger these functions. Let's make sure we understand what each of these functions do. This is actually going to create each line item. This is going to populate the line item with data and This is going to configure each line item to have that listener. Configure each line item to have that listener. So, get item count. That's necessary by the parent class. Again, a lot of the code that does the looping is invisible to us because it's in the ancestor class. But it does need to know what the item count is, so we have a function that returns that. So the first thing that happens is we create a view. What kind of view is it? In our case, it is going to be a text box. But it could be any view. We could have a view that was a linear layout, or we could have an edit text field, or we could have a slider, or a checkbox, or anything. So all we know for sure is that for each item in our recycler, we're going to have a view. And that view contains some stuff. All right? How is that view created? That view is created by executing layout inflator, and we give it an XML file. So what does that do? that creates a view by taking the XML in here and bringing it into life. Bringing it to life. So now our view is a text view. The view that got created is a text view. How do I know that? Because that's what's in the XML file. We're inflating that XML file. Think of this as a template that we're using to create each row in our recycler view. So we inflate that. And whatever we get as a result of inflating it, again, it could be one view, could be views inside of views. All right? Whatever we get is pointed to by this variable view. It happens to be a text view that has an ID of text view.
So that's what these lines of code do in the adapter. And it returns a view holder for that item. gets inflated one at a time, it returns a new view holder that gets created by this. So we assign the view, whatever view is created, we assign the two listeners to it. So this returns a new view holder. All right. So we get a view holder for each row. Each time we create a view holder. We create the view holder by calling this guy. This is just a tad confusing because this class is right smack dab in the middle of the code here. If I was doing this, I would put the, and that threw me for a second. If I was doing this, I would put this code here at the very bottom. This is the class definition. These are the functions that are in the adapter that make a view holder for every row that is in our tags array. Yes? Um, if, you, if it wasn't a dynamic amount of views, could you inflate like the whole activity pool of uh, more than one uh, text, text views? Could you write code to Yes, but this, the way that this structure of a recycler adapter works, you could only reinflate one at a time. I could write code in another context that wasn't associated with a recycler view um, that inflated and created three rows in something at the same time. So anything that's in the XML can be, can be inflated. And again, that view that we're creating, in our case, it's just a text, uh, a text view. It could be itself a linear layout, and we use then that consisted of two text views if we wanted to. All right. So remember, this, just by virtue of being in a recycler um, adapter uh, class, something that extends that, is going to get executed for every row. This is also going to get executed for every row. So we create our view, we return that view holder, and then we go in and we set the text view with the text. And where do we get the text from? We get the text from the position uh, in that array list. So the first time through, position is going to be zero. The second time through, position is going to be one, and so on. So each iteration through that loop, we get a different position number, and we populate that text view with that particular value from the array list. So these two functions happen for each row. We create the view that is going to contain, we create the view holder, rather, that is going to contain the new line in the recycler view, and we set its value by saying, in that view holder, give me the text view and set the text to the value from the tag array. This says, I'm going to create my new view holder by inflating that layout, and then I'm going to return to create a new view holder. I'm returning the new view holder that I'm creating. And the view holder that I'm creating, I give it a, a view, and I give it the two listeners that I want to have done. Now again, remember, I wrote this, or not me, but the programmer wrote this to constructor. So you could give it whatever listeners or other properties you want to give it. In this case, we are giving it two things, the new view that got created and the listeners that we want to apply. All right? So... 
because we've created the new view holder, and this gets looped through, and we set the, uh, set the uh, text for it, the other thing we do is as we create this view holder, we go and we find the view called text view, uh, find a view with an ID of text view. We know that it's a text view, right, because we know that's the only thing in the XML file, and then I set the two listeners for it. This answers the question that I asked last time of how can we have two things with an ID of text view? Don't they run into each other or get into each other's way? And the answer is no, because in this code we are only looking at one line at a time. We're only looking at one of these things. And any one of these things only has one view called text view. So repeat, to repeat the process, the XML file gets inflated, which actually creates a view object. That's what the inflation means. Create an actual object from this layout, this description of a view. It's inflated, it actually creates the view, and it has an ID of text view. We then do a couple of things. We, uh, we create a new view holder and pass the two on-click events, on-click and on-click long. And then we have the code on the bottom that loops through and sets the tag to each, uh, sets the appropriate tag for each thing. And that's what this code does. So as we're binding it to the recycler view, we set the value of that text view. All right, so the bottom line is when we're done, we have our list with a row for everything that's been saved previously that has listeners associated with it for on click and on long click. Let's go back to the main activity. That takes us up through the end of our on activity create. There's a couple other things that we do. We grab a pointer to the save floating action button. We set its listener. And then we call this update save FAB. This update save FAB's only purpose is to look and see if it should show or hide that floating button. If you remember, that button appears somewhere over here, all right? But it only appears when it's ready to save. When is it ready to save? When both those fields have been put in. So if I type in this for this, as soon as I type that in, it's visible. If I get rid of this, then it's not visible. Well, when the application first loads, there's nothing in there, so it calls that method and it hides that button. So after we do everything, we're going to check to see if we should show or hide that button. All right. So we have a text watcher. And this is a text watcher for which? Or is it both? It's actually a text watcher for both. All right. Because what does it do? The text watcher, as I'm changing the text, it looks to see whether it should enable or disable the, uh, the button. All right? Why can this get away? Why do we only have one text watcher in this case? Don't we need two? We have two text fields. Why do we only have one text watcher? The answer to that question is going to be one of two things, all right? It's going to be either we're doing the exactly the same thing regardless of what box we type into, or the text watcher is smart enough to tell what box we've typed into and to do different things. What do you 
think the case is this time? Are we doing the exact same thing? Or is the text watcher smart enough to know what, what bots we're typing into? Well, let's look at the code. Text watcher has one line and one line only. Update, save, FAB. What is update, save, FAB? That's the code that, sh that says whether to show or hide the floating action button. Well, there's no checking to see which view that we've typed into. There's, there's nothing like that. I don't think that's even an argument here. So it's not a case that these are the, this is smart enough to know what view we've been typing in. The answer to the question is we only have one text watcher because that's all we need to do. Regardless of what text box they type in, we do the exact same thing. So if they type in the top one, if they type in the bottom one, we do the same thing. When the text changes, we decide if the button should be enabled or not. That's all we do. We're not calling a function like we did with the tip calculator or with your currency conversion. We're not like calling a function to go and do something based on what they've typed in. All we're doing literally is looking to see if we want to show that button or not. And that button depends on both of those buttons having something in both of those buttons. So if we have something in both of those buttons, it will show it, otherwise it hides it. That's the only thing we need to do after they've typed it in. All right, so we only need one listener for that. Okay, so we've entered something in both and the button appears and we click the button. Well, what do we call? Well, what's our on-click listener? Save. Save button listener. Okay, what does save button listener do? It grabs pointers to the individual text, edit text fields. If one of them uh, or the other one is empty, If it's not empty, if one or the other, if, if both of them are not empty, all right, it'll hide the keyboard. That's what this does. It will add tag search, and it will pass it the tag in the query, all right. Then it clears out the two text fields, and it sets the focus back in the query text field, okay. So what does add tag search do? What do you think add tag search is going to do? Well, we're going to save it somewhere. Where are we going to save it? Where are we saving the data for this one? In the shared preferences. So we're going to need to do two things. We're going to need to save it in the shared preferences, and we're going to need to rewrite the, the recycler to include the new one. Because if I put something in, let's put something in that goes between Cleveland Sports and uh, LCCC. So let's put in Illyria. I'm typing in there. Every time I press a key, it's looking to see, do I, can I enable that button now? Can I enable it? Well, I can't because there's nothing in that second field. Now that I type something in there, I can enable it. I can click Save. Notice what happens. Keyboard is going to disappear. It is going to blank out these fields and my cursor is going to be up there. And Illyria is going to be at the proper place in the list. So boom. There we go. So we're up there with the cursor. Our button disappeared again. It cleared out the two values in the text box and Illyria appears there. So, these three are trivial statements. They just blank out and set the focus. This one is really the one doing the work, right? It's adding our tag to the shared preferences. So
It's actually pretty simple. We create a shared preference editor. The shared preference editor is, the, is, is our, our hook to go in and make changes to the shared preference. All right? That's what we use to do that. There's special. What do these two things do? What do these things do? This one actually adds the new associative array element. What's an associative array again? It's an array where it has a name or a tag or a key as the index. So I'm adding to my shared preferences. All right. In my section, I'm doing it to the save, save searches section. I'm adding the new tag. All right. And the query associated with that tag. So now my shared preferences has been updated. And then I do an apply. Think of an apply as being like a database commit. All right. I don't know if you're familiar with the database commit, but that's sort of like finalizing your answer. Because sometimes you can do work on a database and decide, uh, sometimes you can have code that updates a database, and if something happens, you want to back out of the most recent updates. Let's say, for example, if you're writing a transaction in a bank, all right? If you're writing a transaction to a bank, you have to have a debit and a credit, right? Or like in, in accounting software. Debits always have to match credits. Right, that's the one thing I remember from my minor in accounting, right, is debits have to equal credits, right? So if I were to update the debits but not update the credits, I can't let that happen. I have to stop the wheels and roll back that transaction. So transactions in a database mean that either everything succeeds or everything fails. All right? It's a similar thing here. We can actually execute our statement and if there's a problem with something, we can back out of it if we want to. So we can then go and apply those. So we can make the changes, we can go and test some things if we want to, and then we can apply. This takes care of the shared preferences. So the next time we open our phone, that will be in the shared preferences, which means it gets put in the tag uh, array, which blah, 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 which means it will appear on the list. But we have to go in and fix it now. All right, we have to fix the display now to reflect the new thing that we entered. All right. So what we do is we see if the tag that we just entered is in the tag array. All right, the tag array. What is the tag array? The tag array is initially is going to be the um, initially is going to be what what we loaded what was saved previously. Assuming this is like the first update we do, this would be the tag array would contain what was loaded previously. We look to see if that tag is already there, because if we just edited a tag, we don't need to add it to the list because it was already there. All right. This is the same code, add tag search, gets executed whether we have added a new tag or whether we have edited a tag. All right. So, therefore, we have to look to see what happens. If it's just an edit, then we don't need to do anything because that tag's already listed there. If I go in, for example, and edit this guy, maybe add Ohio to this query, and I go and save it, that tag CCC is already in shared preferences, right? It was there from before. So I don't need to add it to the visual display because it's already there before. If, however, I were to change the tag, or if I was inserting a brand new tag, then I would need to add it. 
So when I click save, notice, boom, doesn't do anything. But if I added a new one, like when I added Illyria, it goes and will add it. So what do I do? If it wasn't there before, I add it to the tags array. Makes sense, right? I then sort it. That way it will be in alphabetical order. And then I tell the adapter, guess what? Your data has changed. All right? So, if remember, the data, if you remember the example we had before, we had a, we had a drawing, had a web page with a drawing that showed my recycler view, a data set, and an adapter in the middle. If our data set changes, we got to tell the adapter about that. And we say, hey, your data has changed. And therefore, what's going to happen? This adapter is going to go through and do everything it did before, just like when we initially loaded the page. It's going to go and recreate everything. It's going to recreate all those views. It's going to repopulate those views. It's going to reset those um, click listeners. All right, so it's effectively recreating everything in that recycler view after we've entered something in. Yes? Does that if statement keep you from having two of the same tags with different yes. searches? Yes, it keeps you from having two of the same tag with different searches. Because what would happen is if I did go and uh, That's a good question of if I try to enter a duplicate. Because if I go in and I change the tag, that's what will actually insert it again. All right? So like if I were to change Illyria to Illyria OH, I'll actually have two searches then, an Illyria and Illyria OH. Because every time you change it, if, every time you go and do an update, if the tag wasn't there, it inserts a new one. What would happen if I tried to enter a duplicate tag in? Cleveland Cross Country. Uh-oh. Guess what it did? It overwrote it. So I would call that a bug. But that was a great question. It didn't put two of them in. Right? Uh, a associative array can't work with two things. If you go in and, and update it, it's going to, it's going to, if you go and add it again, if it's already there, it's going to replace what's there before. So I would describe that as a bug. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. No, no, it, it's not a bug that it doesn't insert a duplicate. It's a bug that it didn't warn me. Because like later on, I look and say, well, where's my Cuyahoga Community College search? Oh, yeah, I got rid of that when I did that. So. Okay, so that tells you that the data set has changed. So the adapter goes back and does its thing again and, and redoes everything effectively, recreates all those view, uh, view holders, applies the on click listener, blah, 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 repop, recreates them, re gives them their value, and resets the listers for them. All right, we have two more things to talk about with this application. One of them is what happens when we click on this. All right, the other one is what happens when we long click on this. My guess is I'm going to talk about what happens when we click on this today, and we'll save the long click until whatever day we meet again. I was going to say Monday, but we don't meet on Mondays. Tuesday. All right, so remember we defined in our adapter that for each of these items, there is a on-click listener, which is this guy right here. Nope, not that one. This one, the item click listener. Okay, now. If you've been thinking about this for a minute, I'm going to do
do a different thing if I click this versus if I click this, right? If I click on this one, it should do my search for what I, the search that I have tagged Cleveland Sports, which it does, Browns, Indians, and Cavs. LCCC, it does Lorain County Community College, does my search there. So obviously we're doing something a little different depending on what we click on. So all of those have the same click of uh, uh, um, listener, just like those two text boxes had the same text listener. What's the difference here? The difference here is the code is smart enough to know which guy you clicked. All right. Remember, with the text listener, it didn't matter because we did the same thing regardless of which text box we changed. All we were doing was hiding and showing that button. Here, we want to do something else because, yes, we are in both cases, no matter what you click on, you're going to do a query, but the details of the query changed. Okay, so now, private, final, on click listener, I am click listener equals... And then there's a view here. What do you think this view is? What does that view represent there? There's all kinds of views in this application, right? What is this view right here? Pardon me? No. This view represents, and again, this is just the way that on click listeners work. The view here represents the view that you actually clicked on. So if I click on this one, this view, that text box, all right, text view, is going to be passed into this function as the view. If I click on this one, this text view. So this function gets, I think I messed something up. No, I didn't. Or did I? Okay, I say now I'm worried. Well, I hope it still works. Otherwise, I'll have to download a new copy. Oh, close it, Mike. Yeah, there we go. It was open and I closed it. There you go. So, I declare my on-click listener, and there is a public void on-click. This is an item click listener. An item, in order to be an item click listener, what do you need? You need an on click event. That on click event automatically gets past the view. The view represents the view that got clicked on. So what are we going to do? We're going to find in that view that, that we got clicked on, we're going to find the thing called Oh, pardon me. We're not using the find. We know that that view is a text view, right? Because that's what all the views in that recycler uh, view is. So therefore, we know it's a text view, so we can cast it as a text view. What does it mean by casting it as a text view? We can treat it like it's a text view, because we know that it's a text view, all right? If I know it's a text view, then I can call the functions related to the text view. That view could theoretically be any kind of view. We could have an on-click listener on any sort of view. A button, um, an image, anything like that. But we know that this listener is applied to views that are text views. Yes? Because an on-click listener is an on-click listener for any sort of view. There isn't a separate on-click text view. So all of the views have the same kind of click listener. So therefore, 
this argument is always going to be a view. Because again, that's part of the framework. We're just overriding it. This function is what gets called when you click on that view, regardless of the kind of view that it is. And there isn't a special one of these for text and whatever. So we have to cast it as, as that. So essentially what we do is we grab the text of that. Well, what is the text for that? The text for that is a tag from our shared preferences file. So, what do we do? We grab the tag. We then create our URL. And we grab from our shared preferences the string that is associated with that tag. So we're using the associative array. So we have our tag. The string associated with that tag is the actual search that we want to text. We do this URI encode just in case that there's special characters. Uh, there's special characters that, that mean something special in a URL, like an ampersand or a question mark or a space. All right, We don't want those messing up the query. So we do a URI encode, and that makes our search safe to go and execute. And our URL is simply the mobile Twitter web page, search Q equals at. Where did we get that from? We got that from Twitter. That's how you do a, a query on that. I then create a new web intent. All right? And that intent we talked about before is going to create a new activity. All right? This is where, if I'm not mistaken, if I had Twitter installed on my device, it might ask me if I wanted to open it up via Twitter or open it up via my web browser. I believe because I don't have Twitter installed on the emulator, it's going to open it up in the web browser. So an intent says I want to do something. Whether I can do it or not is another matter because it might depend on what I have installed on my device. And then, so I've created an intent to do this, to pull up this URL, all right, this new web intent says I want to open up a certain web page, and that web page is this URL string that I parse and do some kind of processing to, whatever. And then I actually go and make it so, and actually go in and execute that intent. And that's what opens up the web browser and points it to that URL. Questions about this. Tuesday, what we will do is we will visit the long click listener. It's a different kind of event, right? It's going to look real similar, right? Because it's going to get past the view, all right? We could have a long click listener on anything. We could have it on an image. We could have it on a button. We could have it anywhere. So same deal. We have to go and grab that text view. The difference is, is we don't have one action that we have to do. We have a potential to do multiple actions. Because on a click, we go and do the query. On the long click, we bring up edit, um, delete, and whatever the other options are. So we actually make a dialog box and then decide what to do based on that. So that is what... Uh, we'll look at next time. A good activity, again, would be to go and try to comment the code in this one to make sure you understand all the different pieces and parts of what's done. The part that gets confusing to me, all right, is the way, and so I would imagine possibly it would be confusing to you, is just this whole business about the, um, how the uh, adapter works, all right, and how the adapter works um, to create a view holder for every item in the data source. And what I think is especially confusing is the way they have this class smack dab in the middle of the other functions. That makes it, in my mind, hard to read. I would have put that code at the bottom. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Are the shared uh, preferences implicitly associated with race? Yes. The only difference is that a shared preference, 
we're storing, st we're storing strings in our shared preferences. You could also share um, other things like numbers. I don't know if you could share an object, put an object in there, but you could definitely store numbers and stuff in there. I'm not sure like if you could store an object in there. Um, but yeah, they, the, the, it is an associative array. No, no. The only thing you'd have to declare is the kind of thing that you're putting in there. And even that I don't think you have to worry about because I think it's smart enough to see the, the, the function's overloaded. So if I have a double there, it's going to put it in a double value. If it's a string, it's going to put it in a string value. Anything else? Yes. Well, because, all right, let's look, let's look closely at this. Both of these text boxes have the same listener, text watcher. What does text watcher do? Text watcher will fire off when either of them are changed. All right, so when either of them are changed, on text change is going to fire off. All right. What makes it so that the button only appears when both of them have been values entered in is this update save FAB. Because this update save FAB looks to make sure that both of them are visible. All right? And that's the code that does it. So in other words, every time I change either of those fields, I go up here and type something. It fired off that event. It looked, it fired up the text watcher event. The text watcher event says, should I show or hide that button? The show or hide button function looks and says, well, there's something in the first text box, but nothing in the second text box. So no, I'm not going to show it. I'm going to keep it hidden. Same thing for each of these characters. Every time I press the character, it fired off that event. I go over here and start typing here. Boom. It fired off that event, but this time, both things are filled. And the reverse are true, too. If I had nothing in here, if I was typing in here, every time I type a key, it fires off that event. It checks to see if both of them are full. And in this case, both of them are not full, so it doesn't show it. It keeps it hidden. Keeps it hidden. Other questions? All right. Uh, we will see you on uh, Tuesday.